You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. Welcome to MCC's uh, podcast series. Uh, my name is uh, Huub Ruel. Yes, that's may sound Dutch. I'm the host and today in MCC's podcast series, we've got uh, a distinguished guest, Paul Gilfillan from Scotland. He's a Scottish scholar. Indeed. And he's a senior visiting fellow at MCC. We're very happy to have you here. This is great. And uh, thank, thank you for the invitation, Hoop. Uh, thank you for accepting. Um, and with Paul, I would love to discuss um, um, a few super uh, spot-on topics in uh, when it comes to nationalism, Scottish nationalism, connected to Hungarian nationalism nowadays, Brexit, Scotland, the EU, um, and uh, call it spiritual development or religious education in Scotland currently, and how uh, Paul sees the future of religious education in um, in schools nowadays and for the future. Uh, These so, are all huge topics here. These oh yeah. are really and I forgot the football part. Very, oh, and, and football, <laughs> of course. You can't, can't forget Let's football. see where do we get there. <laughs> <laughs> or should we start there? No, it's okay. We can oh. get to football. I, I, I'll, I'll, I talk too much about football, but anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Paul. Um, I mean, of course, I could introduce uh, you and, 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 you know, repeat and mention your uh, terrific CV, but uh, I would love to... Uh, you yourself introduce yourself. Yeah, well, I'm um, I'm a senior lecturer in sociology at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh. Um, my research interests are all the all the kinds of things whom that can get you into trouble: religion, politics, nationalism, education. Um, um, so all of these um, topics are, are really interesting to me. We were talking earlier on about my doctoral studies. Uh, I trained as an ethnographer, as a social anthropologist at Edinburgh University. And so I spent two or three years immersed in a locality, a, a deindustrializing locality. And so I was looking at the, the relationship between class and nationalism. And what I'm what I'm writing about currently is um, is a sociology of Christianity, specifically Catholicism, in, in my own national context. And uh, I, 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 I did mention this to you, um, Hoop, but uh, tomorrow morning I, I'm jumping on a plane, so this is my last um, day in and this beautiful country, so I'm sad to go, but um, it's great to have a chance to sit and talk to you today. So, more or less, uh, this is uh, something what we could call the legacy of uh, Paul here, <laughs> because the, this podcast will be available on the different platforms. So yes, fantastic. that's great. Okay, before we start to really get into, you mentioned this beautiful country, so please, why actually uh, did you come to Hungary? What, what well, brought you here? Well, I mentioned there, Hoob, that, I, that I'm a lecturer in Queen Margaret University in, in Scotland. Queen Margaret, of course, was born in Hungary. She's a Hungarian um, um, national. And so every year since uh, I've been working at Queen Margaret for about 15 years now, and every year there, there was always a kind of um, communication to all the members of staff about um, this fellowship at MCC. And for a few years now, I've been meaning to investigate it and, and see what it was all about. So last year I finally did, and the rest is history. So I, I had always had a mind to investigate it, the opportunity to come to Hungary. Um, I mean, also personally in my own intellectual development, Hungarian uh, intellectuals have been really, really important. Um, last Sunday, um, I went to the grave of um, um, Georgi Lukács, the Hungarian philosopher who had a who wrote a book in 1923 called History and Class Consciousness and it had a huge impact on me as a young boy so i was kind of hungarian the hungarian intellectuals have been part of me stanley yaki a really famous um, um, hungarian philosopher of science uh, another um, great hungarian who's well known outside of hungary and he had a huge impact on my development as well so yeah uh, clear that <laughs> sounds like you really uh, have this clear connection with Hungary, and yes. that was uh, what brought you here. Um, one of the things that 
currently I think attracts uh, loads of attention, so to speak, is is uh, is, is Scotland, Scotland and Scottish nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, especially since Brexit and 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 the things that are yes. that are going on in the United Kingdom. So far, still united. Yes, yes. Uh, could you please explain a bit more? You know, what's the current state of Scottish nationalism and Perhaps that's also connected a bit with what you studied in... Yeah, in, in I mean, that's a great question. Who really, I mean, my doctorate was looking at the rise of nationalism. Where national, nationalism is today in Scotland, it's a really contested um, area because so many nationalists are... are um, it, it, it's as if they have all been marched to the top of a hill in 2014 in the independence referendum. And then suddenly they've reached the top of the hill and, they, and it feels like we're having to go back down now. And of course, two years after the independence vote, there was Brexit. So I, I would say, Hub, that uh, Scottish society is super, super politicised. After, after a, a campaign that was months and months in the making, it's all, I, don't, I don't want to over-dramatise it, but really... Everybody in Scotland is kind of on one side of the fence or the other. Really, yeah. And it really is, um, the constitutional question is deeply, deeply divisive, but it, it also energizes people a huge. Um, and, and in the little village that I come from, something like one in every 50 people became a member of the Scottish National Party. I mean, that is incredible. And so it's super politicized, um, but also it, it does feel as if, um, we kind of missed our great chance. Uh, nationalism in Scotland, it's a very much a, it's a generational question as well. Anybody in the UK that is 60 years old or older was born into the British Empire. And one of the things that became really clear was that there is a huge generational gap. And basically, if all the old people were not allowed to vote in 2014, we would be independent by now. All of the people who don't have that sense of the Second World War, being born into an empire, that strong national identity. All of the younger people, they are much more comfortable with a, a almost, I would say, an exclusively Scottish identity. And so they were much more um, um, more likely to vote for independence. And then, of course, when we two, two years later, with the whole Brexit, that was like opening a, a, an old wound all over again. Um, one of the phrases that you often hear to describe the Scottish context is something called the democratic deficit. Mm -hmm. So, for example, the Scots since 1979, the Scots keep voting one way, but they keep voting for parties, policies, and politicians of whatever ideological complexion, but they get the opposite. So it's almost as if the Tory government no longer has a democratic mandate in Scotland. Now, of course, that is a very nationalist way to look at it. Mm -hmm. If if your basic frame of reference is a Scottish national identity, then you can talk about something called the deficit. Mm -hmm. However, if you have a British identity, then of course um, you, you take the whole country or the whole United Kingdom. And so, and so you arrive at very different conclusions. But um, one of the things that, that's happened since I've been in Hungary is that a lot of people have asked me to, to speak about um, in the various MCC centres. They've asked me to try to help Hungarian audi audiences understand um, why Brexit happened. And it's so strange, Hub, because I understand perfectly well why Brexit happened. It's the same thing in the English context. What happened in England is the same thing that tried to happen in Scotland. There's a kind of political union that increasingly people felt alienated from, that it was removed, remote, etc. So it's quite strange. Even although I was somebody who voted to remain within the EU, um, all of the arguments that were, that were being put forward by the Brexiteers like Nigel Farage, etc., that this idea of a... Um, being in the, this political union from an English point of view, it was unrepresentative, it was remote, it was bureaucratic. And all of these arguments were very familiar because we rehearsed them two years earlier in the independence referendum. There are, thank you, I mean, a number of interesting things that, that you've touched upon, Yeah, many of them. But um, first of all, uh, just a very direct question. Yep. Would you, what do you think about a Scottish independence from from the United Kingdom, would that is that something that, that you would be in favour of? Yes, I mean, yes. Yeah. I I am one of those. I mean, I was born in the mid sixties, um, Hoop, so I'm Generation X. So I am, I am, I am absolutely. Um, I suppose I would I, I would normalise independence. You know, like um, you know, 
maybe we, later on we can talk about Hungary. But one of the things I tell my students is that, you know, with, with, the, uh, with the ending of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, what really came to an end was the multinational state. And of course, the United Kingdom is one of the very, very, very few multinational states. Normally, for me, I'm a nationalist. And all I mean by that is normally what, what should happen is the nation and the state are the same thing. That's all I mean. When I describe myself as a nationalist, that's all I mean is simply that the Scottish nation should have a state of its own. The idea that we would be best represented by others or, or a pooled sovereignty, that for me is um, silly. As I've mentioned before, I think I'm part of a younger generation who that are educated, affluent, etc. And it's increasingly um, seen as not normal <laughs> to not be sovereign in your own uh, uh, political area. And how does that connect with your view that Scotland should stay within the EU, whereas the EU, in the, within the EU, nationalism as such is 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 a well, debated this, kind of a concept as well. No, right? and of course this is something that's very much alive and kicking in Hungary. Um, let me say that I am certainly enthusiastic for independence, and I'm certainly enthusiastic for you know continuing free trade agree agreements with England and the EU. But certainly historically, Hub, the, the percentage of people when it comes to voting in the EU elections in Scotland and the UK is very low, actually. I would have to say that I think something 30-something percent is normally the, the, the rate of participation. So the, the, fra the frank answer is there isn't great enthusiasm for for the EU, I think one of the, um, you know, after the great initial um, excitement or enthusiasm, I think the EU is maybe similar to the United Kingdom. It's, it seems to have lost its raison d'etre. It's no longer um, seems to have a clear uh, motive up, above and beyond simply economic uh, and commerce, etc. Um, and I think this is one of the huge problems that the EU has. It's uh, what it's for above and beyond, you know, like a European identity, but what exactly does that mean, etc. And of course, if you are unhappy with certain ideological directions um, that, you, that are clearly being endorsed by the EU, um, then that would give, you know, people like myself who would be more conservative um, grave cause for concern. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of people who would say, well, we don't really we want independence, yes, but... We, we don't want to then submerge ourselves within our kind of super European um, state that is kind of authoritarian in its liberalism, mm -hmm. for example. Indeed. And and what you see, uh, I mean, according to many, uh, Brussels, yes. <laughs> which um, reflects or, or, or stands for federalism, mm, yeah. uh, not... To all of them, and if you yes. look at, the, but but what's your view on this? Well, huh? certainly, most of the nationalists that I know, and I'm and I know a lot of them. I'm very familiar with them, but um, they would be against a, a kind of federal EU. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the idea of having fought for so long to regain independence and then suddenly just to give it away the following day to you know, um, I don't think that would sit well with most people. I would also say, Hub, that I think really the Scots are are not super politicized over the EU, mm -hmm. but certainly if and when independence comes, that will change quickly. Mm -hmm. Because then people will really start to, to, to take a look at the EU and you know the benefits and the disadvantages of joining. Um, so there is, a, there is um, the leadership is very united, the uh, Scottish National Party leadership, but I would say the membership, not so much. And certainly nationalists more generally, um, I think you would find a, a lot of um, people who would be uh, for, and but also a lot of people who would have serious misgivings about simply um, joining the EU. Mm -hmm. And and uh, you said something interesting, like having fought for so long for sovereignty and then being becoming part of something yes. bigger. That may also apply to a bit of what what Hungarians may feel absolutely after the collapse of the Soviet uh, Union. Let's yes. Say, and, and I mean, you can see it, who I would imagine, you know, Hungary, of course, and uh, Poland as well. Um, but also, you know, I mean, I think throughout Europe, there are, there are now people that are raising voices as to what exactly is the purpose. And I think the, um, you know, the, 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 the sovereigntists who want to, who are happily part of the EU, but don't want a federal EU. Clearly, that is the huge issue that's going on. And um, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, Hungary and perhaps Poland, they're kind of the... Uh, the, the spear or the tip of the spear on mm -hmm. this point. 
But certainly uh, it's a live issue also um, in, in Scotland back home. The whole question of um, sovereignty, it's huge as to where it lies. Um, and of course, you know, like clearly the, um, I think perhaps the English are much better at escaping political unions that they don't like than the Scots are. Maybe the English are, are more courageous, yeah. but um, that, 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 of course, that's why um, the Brexit happened. Mm -hmm. This tremendous sense of um, um, alienation. I think more generally, who this notion of kind of liberal democratic politics today, people feeling a kind of alienation in, in a globalized economy, globalized world, people who are not perhaps um, as successful as others. Mm -hmm. And then that puts liberal democracy itself into a bit of a, a, bit of a crisis. Yeah. And, and, and yeah, interesting a lot. One, one could say even, um, once again, back to the EU, but please let me know what your view on this. Yeah. Uh, so you've got the EU and, uh, and, and it seems that uh, globalization, you know, went along with the, 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 the re-emergence of this localization of the feeling of, 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 of losing this identity. And you yeah. see across Europe, regions rather than nations even... Yeah. Uh, gaining or regaining their regional kind of a pride. I mean, look in Spain, okay, maybe that's the most obvious uh, mm -hmm. example, but there are plenty of regions perhaps. Or do you see something similar? And do you see the this re-emergence of this, the, the, the focus on the regional identities or national identities as, as something anti this liberal democratic yeah I, th I think so. um, I mean for example I mean my basic my basic position would be something like this who um Nationalism is is a very non-liberal thing to do. Mm -hmm. Nationalism is basically about putting up a border. Mm -hmm. And even nationalists in Scotland who, who like to think of themselves as nice liberals and who don't like to think of themselves as putting up barriers, etc., etc., I think they're fooling themselves. I think that's a form of false consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, we, in Scotland, we have this thing of called um, civic nationalism this kind of really well-behaved nationalism that's very nice and it wants to be your best friend. I think, um, um, you know, nationalism, it is about putting up borders. It is about making distinctions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, 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 the kind of the territorial imperative. So, yes, absolutely. I think when people feel that they're going to become lost or merged into this global, then probably they're going to lose something. So they have to react. Mm -hmm. And absolutely, this is what's happened in Scotland. Um, the Scottish national movement really, up until the 1970s, um, was marginal. Mm -hmm. But I think what's happened, Hoob, is um, once the Scots discovered lots of North Sea oil, once they became affluent, um, their politics fundamentally shifted. It's almost as if, um, and of course, obviously this is true generally throughout you know, post-war Europe. Once you, once you solve the basic problem of bread, then your politics has to become about something else. So what it becomes about is culture. So in the Scottish context, that has meant the mobilization around issues of uh, no longer class, but around issues of national identity. And I think what happens when people become affluent, they become addicted and, norm and, and, and they normalize um, freedom of choice, a sense of agency. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this democra democratic deficit that I was mentioning earlier, it becomes more and more intolerable. Mm -hmm. When you are accustomed to exercising agency and freedom, um, to suddenly, uh, uh, at a political level, be denied it, uh, that's a big problem. So what the Scots have done is they have reasserted, if you like, they've kind of dusted off their national identity and they have politicized it and in a way that was never done before. And I think the, the, the preconditions for that is to solve the kind of material class-based issues. And once you've solved these basic problems, then, you, then politics becomes about class. Sorry, it becomes about nation. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening certainly in, um, in Scotland. And of course, we saw it with the Brexit, it's happening with Englishness as well. Of course, England also is a stateless nation. Mm -hmm. So part of the success of the Brexit movement was this reassertion of a, a perhaps a suppressed English national identity. Um, but of course, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Spain. Yeah, Spain as well, of course, um, the Catalonia, etc. People are becoming um, much more aware of their cultural patrimony, and they're much more ready to politicize it. Thank you, yeah. Move on a bit, because yeah. uh, we would love to uh, use this past podcast uh, as um, as efficient as possible, let's say, and to what we earlier mentioned, your legacy here at MCC, you know, uh, talking about um, religion yeah. and education. 
you wrote about it. And uh, if I understood you correctly, you currently think that um, religious education in Scotland, but perhaps across Europe and in many schools, uh, is, 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 is basically a relativist kind of an, a way of yeah. uh, educating people in, in spiritual development rather than something, a particular tradition. Yes. And you consider that as a very, very bad uh, development. Yeah, it, uh, although perfectly understandable in many ways. One of, one of my kind of basic themes um, when I've been talking to young people in, in uh, the various MCC centers here in Hungary, um, who is, I would say, I, I just, I was mentioning earlier about politics now becomes about something else. I think for young people now, the great question in their life is how to live a meaningful life. Mm-hmm. Um, generations, young, young people now, like for example, I teach genuine millennials. So I, I now have in my classroom um, kids that were born, you know, after the year 2000. The basic problems of bread, material, food, all of these have been solved. So the great problem for them is about um, meaning. Um, what, what does a meaningful life look like? Um, another idea that I that I developed with my students is, is the notion that the younger people are the ones that are experiencing a civilization level crisis of faith or step change, if you like. Um, I don't. I don't want to kind of get in too much to it here because it, it, it starts to get a bit complicated. But I would say, for example, that among the younger generation, the Enlightenment legacy has died. It, it has dropped dead. The paradoxical reason for that is because the Enlightenment has been so successful. It no longer has any enemies. Its victory is so total that, in order for a, a new generation, um, you you cannot have the myth of the Enlightenment unless there is some darkness that you're escaping from unless there is some great exodus or liberation. And the paradoxical thing is, the great exodus or the great liberation that is only possible for a younger generation is the enlightenment itself, is to escape from that kind of a materialist, a purely naturalist, um, to escape from that legacy of rejecting Christianity, um, tradition, ancestors. And so I, I, this is how I kind of frame um, my task as an educator um, standing in front of young people. I, I think it's that, that that fundamental framing is accurate because these are these um, younger generations. They are so unanchored into tradition. They are almost illiterate in terms of being religiously um, um, fluent, if you like. But of course, their great problem is that you know if they're trying to articulate the, the meaning of their lives, but they don't have these resources. Um, all kinds of freedom can happen, all kinds of originality can happen, which is great, but all kinds of bad things can happen as well. You know, kind of people, well, people getting entirely lost in, in their lives and um, you know, um, having utterly kind of utopian and, and silly ideas that um, for, for the life of them, they can't imagine why they're not um, followed. Um, you know, like today we're, or these, these days we're having the, Christ, the, the, uh, the conference here in uh, MCC Budapest about what values do we teach our children? Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a great question. And of course, they're kicking around all of these um, really interesting questions. But one of the things that I found in my own research, um, who was it? teachers, schools themselves are part of this problem. They are entirely immersed in this relativism. They are entirely... Uh, how come? Uh, Just, they, how go, come, actually? Well, where, where did we get it? Where did we lose it? Or well, from a conservative perspective? Well, or? certainly... From the data that I've seen, for example, um, uh, from the 1970s onwards, what we've seen in Scotland is the massive de-Protestantization. Scotland, traditionally a Protestant Calvinist country, but what we've seen from the 60s and 70s is a tremendous um, um, decline in the practice of Protestantism. The the Protestant churches in Scotland don't have their own schools. So the, the, the situation with Catholics is different, but the Protestants no longer have their school. So as soon as a population doesn't go to church, they don't, they're not educated at all in that faith, but also who they are no longer connected to their history, their traditions, their ancestors. And so that from that, from the 70s onwards, the, the kids that are born from that time onwards, they are qualitatively different than their ancestors, their, their, their parents, their grandparents. And as I've mentioned, um, um, it becomes quite, um, it's only a matter of time before, um, you know, I will be meeting um, first year students and they will not know the basic things like the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, um, you know. Um, so again, it's, um, it's, really, it's a privilege to be a teacher, but it's also frightening because what you come face to face with is 
the dramatic consequences of um, education, especially when it isn't done properly, when it's seen as, you know, one of the things that the Scottish government has, has recently done is they've tried to rethink and reimagine Scottish education because it's, it's on various measures, it's decline in decline. And so while I would absolutely applaud, um, the, I, for example, the, the efforts to reimagine or to bring up to date um, what's called in, in the Scottish context, religious observance, I think what has happened is that it's become a kind of um, um, a relativist um, practice that isn't actually about truth, beauty, um, history. It's about um, trying to equip people with um, superficial skills or an ability to, to think about certain questions, but not in any serious way to um, connect them to their traditions and their history, which of course is a, it's a huge, uh, it, it's what you may call a performative paradox. Here we have a Scottish government that has resurrected the nation. If you like, it has dusted off three centuries uh, of oblivion. And what it's now recommending in its schools is the oblivion of its past, or you know, a kind of moving away from its history and traditions, which is really extraordinary when you come to think of it. One could say, I mean, going back a little bit to a few things that you mentioned, because you mentioned again, yeah a number of, or so to speak, even a bunch of interesting things. But one could easily summarize it, okay, yeah, uh, probably, I mean, liberalism um, is the new religion that uh, is so successful because whatever. But what are the dangers of that, call it liberal uh, uh, ideology or, or, or re uh, religion? What, why, why, what would you say to young people? Like, well, uh, I, 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 um, or how would you, why Why would they say like, hey, but what's wrong in it? You know, I Well, um, as an abstract yeah. proposition, who perhaps there's nothing terribly wrong about it, but what you actually find out is that when you actually ask young people, you know, like um, what are their values, beliefs, etc., they genuinely don't have an answer. And it, it's as basic as that. Um, it's really extraordinary to, to, to see, I suppose, in the flesh, once you detach an individual from traditions and history, etc., there's nothing really much left at all. You know, we have this we're, um, um, we have this idea that setting free of the individual is a great thing, and, and liberalism is the champion of that. But that actually is is itself something of a myth. One of the things that's empirically true, I and mean, we see it increasingly clearly, is that often the most liberated individual is the most unindividual person you will ever meet. It's one of these paradoxes in that unless people have um, some kind of, it's almost as if without drawing upon these traditions and, and ancestors, etc., and culture, you're unable to individualize yourself. What you become is, is, is in fact, totally like everybody else, a kind of, a, a kind of um, you know, with the same opinions as, as anybody else. And of course, you become, if you like, a receptacle for power for whatever is the dominant voice in social media or the mainstream media, whatever it happens to be. And um, being an individual is really, really hard work. The idea that you can suddenly become an individual because you're set free from various things is, is a nonsense. What we have, um, you know, you have entire generations that, are, that have full negative freedom. So they're free from all kinds of stuff. But if you ask young people, what are you free for? What is it that you're going to do with your freedom? What is the life that you're going to put together for yourself? Is it beautiful? Is it true, et cetera? And you can't answer these questions. These questions are really, really um, difficult for them because if you, don't, if you don't have a, if you're unable to draw upon the wisdom of previous generations and you have to figure all of that out yourself as a young person, um, you're not going to do it. You'll fail. And this is part of the problem. This is part of the fight in education because clearly, my responsibility as an educator is to kind of, you know, to, to be the kind of, uh, the, the, is to play the role of the Socratic teacher and to try to make students to think about this and, and what is their relationship to the past, et cetera, and what is the questions that should animate them. Um, so, yeah, I think it's um, in the abstract too, but perhaps it's, it's, freedom is a great thing. You know, freedom is a beautiful thing. But when you actually have to then, some of the consequences are really um, um, fraught and it releases all kinds of um, dangers as well. Uh, in your chapter, 
uh, that you're uh, that's going to be published soon. You mentioned the personalism, I think, as the as perhaps the alternative to individualism, right? Yes, Something yes, like yeah. And um, however, you know, due to time limitations of a <laughs> fantastic conversation, which could last for a few hours, and, yes, and yes. sorry not to even um, if you you're here at MCC, MCC yeah. tries. Part of its mission is to really to educate young people in, you know, to, yeah. to, to get them back in touch with Hungarian tradition, history, with 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 value-based thinking in line with the heritage of the Hungarian uh, history. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of it? What did, did it inspire you? Do you think what what? Absolutely. I mean, um, to be honest, um, Hub, I, I found uh, I've, I've been to various MCC centers, Debrecen, um, Zambate. Um, Peach, Your, uh, etc., and I've really, I've so much enjoyed talking to the students. Uh, I found them really engaged and very confident, and so that has been one of the great pleasures of my six months in Hungary. Um, but yeah, it, um, it's um, I, I've recently finished reading um, um, Orban's book, um, um, the the Hungarian way of strategy. In the, yeah. And um, he has a beautiful um, metaphor. He describes Hungary as spinning upon its own axis. And I think that's a fantastic uh, metaphor. And, you know, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm going to develop that in some way uh, uh, when I go back home to Scotland. But I think also this is something Hub, that um, Scotland politically is trying to spin upon its own axis, like Hungary. And, and also, you know, um, areas of contestation like education, I don't think they're, they're there yet. But I think that's part of what has to happen in, in the coming years. And um, Hungary, of course, is, um, has a lot to teach us mm -hmm. what, what they're doing. Um, you know, I, I feel a strong kind of affinity because um, clearly um, it was at 1989 where there was, it was the first free elections to the Hungarian um, parliament. Well, 10 years later, you know, the Scots, we had our first um, democratic elections to our um, new parliament. So, yeah, nationhood and all of the, the massive generational tasks of restoring a country um you know th these are these are um deep um, similarities between scotland and hungary thank you so much paul um thank you for uh, your contribution to for for sharing your ideas no and uh, thank you for the invitation to many of the inspiring things that you're saying and uh, have a great time and hope to see you back here in uh, budapest okay Kosanum. thank you for listening to this mcc podcast episode for further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at korvinek.hu slash en.